was a hot day. The neighboring farms were busy farming wheat in a remote farming village in Kenya, close to the Ugandan border. Abraham, a community healthcare worker, was bringing patients to us one at a time. Now, at the corner of my eye, I saw two men being carefully brought and sat on white plastic chairs in front of us. Both of these gentlemen were blind, and they'd been blind for 10 years. Eight out of every 10 people who are blind are unnecessarily so. They're blind from a condition that we already know how to cure or prevent. But their story is not unique. There are 39 million people worldwide who are blind, and 90% of them are living in low- and middle-income countries like Kenya. Having grown up in the UK and a practicing eye surgeon there with an abundant access to healthcare, I felt compelled to try and do something about it. So in 2012, my wife, our one-year-old son, and I packed our bags and moved to Kenya. We took with us lots of expensive eye equipment with a plan to set up 100 temporary eye clinics. When we got to Kenya, we recruited and trained a team, and we established these 100 clinics across the Great Rift Valley, all to answer these questions about how big is the problem and what could be done about it. Did detailed examinations using all of our kit to try and understand these things as well as we could, and the queues of patients everywhere we went would be growing. Some of them had never seen an eye doctor before in their lives. Getting to these places was difficult. Often there was no road access, and when there was road access, it was very poor. And when we did arrive, there would be rarely electricity able to run our equipment, so we'd run everything from a petrol-powered generator. The thing that used to bother me is the queues would be so long. There were 200, sometimes 300 people waiting when we got there. But something had changed. Something had changed from the 10 years previous when I'd be going out and doing similar work, in that despite there still being no road, still being no water, still being no electricity, there were mobile phones. People were connected in a way they never had been before. And it struck me, surely we could harness this connectivity to deliver eye care in a different way. And that's when Peak was born, the portable eye examination kit a smartphone-based tool that enables non-doctors to deliver comprehensive eye examinations anywhere in the world in any language. We have software tests and hardware adapters that are enabling imaging inside of the eye. Using geotagging, we can share the information with experts remotely to ensure that patients who were previously unfound are being accessed and treated. In our initial trial, which lasted 18 months, comparing this technology to all the expensive equipment that I had, we were able to treat 2,500 people. Last year, in just nine days, 21,000 children were reached, and now we're scaling that up to reach 300,000 children and moving into eight other countries for our work. But this was only scratching the surface. This was only the beginning of the problem. Given that we like challenges, my wife and I, Madeline had given up her work in the UK as a doctor to come and support the project in Kenya. And the one thing she insisted on bringing, as well as our big eye equipment, was her baking equipment. So, with her Kenwood mixer and several recipe books, and our one-year-old in tow, she brought them along and started baking in our kitchen, which had something which you could barely describe as an oven. We ended up calling it a random temperature generator. <laughs> she would often have to bake without electricity. Our challenges in the kitchen were not that dissimilar to out in the field. But, despite that, she continued to bake amazing things, often using the most healthy vegetables available to produce incredible bakes. And the idea was to produce a unique bake for every one of the 100 clinics that we ran to motivate the team and help them encourage them to work as hard as we possibly could. And the team really appreciated this, and it really motivated them. It also resulted in patients appreciating the food as well and often commenting on it. However, the cues of the patients were always there and always growing. The thing that really bothered us was, although we had money to run a trial, we didn't have funds to treat the patients we were finding. So for the first few months, out of our own pockets, we were ensuring that all of these patients who we'd found would get treated. But soon our money was going to run out, and we knew we needed to do something. So one weekend, whilst on a run, I wouldn't describe it as a fun run, because getting beaten by everyone in Kenya um, on a road race is not the most fun. <laughs> but we said, next time we do this, let's do it as a fundraiser. Let's try and generate some money to support the rest of the project. But to make it interesting, let's do it blindfolded. So we ran a 10-kilometer race blindfolded with an aim of raising 10,000 pounds to support patients for the rest of our time in Kenya. 
And thanks to the support of family and friends, we were able to reach and actually exceed that target. We were still struck, though, that our time in Kenya would come to an end, and we'd developed this technology which was enabling more people to access healthcare than before. But those who most needed treatment were always going to be the least likely to be able to pay for it. So we needed to find some sustainable way of delivering eye care without us being there. And given my passion for eyes and health, and Madeline's passion for health and baking, we thought, could we somehow combine the two? And that's exactly what we did. We thought we'd create a healthy bakery whose profits pay for eye care. And we called it the Ujima Bakehouse. Ujima is an old Swahili word, which means community or with the help of others. It's based at Mali Saba Camp, seven miles from the main town, Nakuru, on the edge of the Meningai Crater. And it arguably has the best view of any bakery anywhere in the world. And Ujima is a fitting name for it because it truly has been realized with the help of others, with our family and friends who supported the run, with Mazda who provided us with a grant, but no one more so than the Ujima Foundation, our partners on the ground. They believe that no child should have to grow up outside of a family. And given there are so many orphaned young children, they're committed to supporting young adult orphans with training and hospitality to meet their motto of the best support is self-support. They believe that these young men and women are not victims, but young adults with potential. And through a six-month training course with counseling and training, they go on to get employment and support themselves and their family into the long term. And a graduate of this course, a guy called Justin, is now our head baker, who has been baking in the bakehouse now for over a year. All of this was going on, and we thought, you know, there is a potential here for this bakery to cause harm in the very area that we're trying to support. Bakeries are known for their unhealthy processed foods, and we couldn't be contributing to the very problems that we were trying to solve. Let's take bread as an example. Supermarket bread can have up to 42 ingredients, most of them not on the label, because they're considered part of the process. Whereas real bread, bread in its pure form, as it's been made for millennia, is simply flour, water, and a pinch of salt. No added chemicals, no added fats, no added sugar. The problem is sugar sells, and it sells really well. The other problem with sugar is it causes obesity, it causes blood pressure to rise, and it's addictive. The hit of sugar is not that dissimilar to heroin, and it can lead to people feeling lethargic and the need for more sugar. And food companies know this, and it's a great way to make profit. But we were not willing to have a, a business that sacrificed health for the sake of profit. It was not going to be one or the other, it needed to be both. And the UK government know this is true. Last year, £7 million was spent promoting healthy foods and the avoidance of sugary products. Yet the food and drinks industry spent £700 million promoting those very foods and drinks. So 100 to 1 message. So our one had to count. Now, although Madeline was baking miraculous things from our random temperature generator, we knew we needed expert help. We knew we needed to find somebody who could give us the kind of support to do this on a bigger scale. And so we searched for places, and Madeline came across the E5 Bakehouse, a place in London whose passion and mission was very aligned with ours. And so she wrote to them and said, could I come on a one-day training course, which they offered to her complimentarily. While on the course, learning about sourdough, she said things went great. She said, I've got something interesting to tell you when I get home. She got home with a lovely basket full of sourdough bread and bagels. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. She said, well, Ben, the founder of E5 Bakehouse, has agreed to come to Kenya, and he's going to train the team. I thought, wow, well, that's, that's something pretty impressive. What we weren't prepared for was this was a bakery in Kenya, and there was going to be challenges. The next challenge will be getting the equipment across. And this is really big, heavy kit, and it's going to be hard to put in place. So we're hoping that A, it makes the journey, and B, it works when it arrives. It's fallen over. It's a bit dented, and this panel's been ripped off the side, so all of the insulation's come out. You said it was very well packed. But it was uh, tied. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look. I think actually just getting the equipment into the bakery itself could be an issue, but um, we're assured that there's people that know how to do it. There we go. Front wheels are on the deck. We're going to drop it down and then slide it forward, hopefully. And 
quite tempted to get in there and give it a push, but I'd probably better not. It's a bit risky. We're under no illusions that this is going to be easy. And it certainly hasn't been easy, but the dedication of the team has led to them consistently baking great products day in, day out often baking through the night to make sure our customers have fresh bread first thing in the morning. And we're getting ever closer now to realizing our overall plan, which is that for every 100 loaves of bread that we bake, one person will get their sight restored, and one young adult orphan will go on the training course. But we're only yet scratching the surface. There's so much more we could do. And we're getting closer to realizing those goals. The goal of the bakery was to generate employment and to provide a sustainable way of delivering eye care in this community. Andrew and Madeline, they're not just going to go and borrow money from donors. They're actually trying to make their project more sustainable. We realised it had to be a multi-level approach. That's why the baked goods had to be healthy. It encourages employment, we give training. Then at the end of it all, we're able to support eye care and also the Ujima Foundation. One of the challenges with something like this is that there's a high risk of failure and we've always been of the mindset that we can't be afraid to fail but the challenges are often what opens doors to other things. The guys who have taken this risk want to make a positive impact onto their local community. We've been really pleased with how people have taken it on and they've actually been pushing themselves here. Andrew and Madeline are slackers. <laughs> if I sell a hundred loaves, I get to help one person with employment, I get to help another person with getting eye care. So a thousand loaves a day, that's my, that's my aim. I feel we've achieved the crucial part of opening the bakery, setting it up and getting those orders out there. The difficult part will be actually establishing it as a really sustainable business that's really popular. Sales are moving along quickly and people are very excited to hear about the new bakery. Bread's going down a storm. People absolutely love it. We've had lots of people coming up, having a nibble, and then straight away buying it. They're absolutely positive and, and really keen to sort of support the project. Ben has really infused a passion for baking really good bread, and Madeline spent a lot of time distilling the key health elements of what the bakery's doing. And then when we've seen the team go out and share that with the community, they've really taken on those messages, but more importantly, they're sharing that message much wider. We have some of the staff here and they're very excited about the prospect of having some employment with a product that's so beneficial to the general population. So the next steps from the bakery is really establishing these long-term regular orders. That's what's going to support it and to keep it flowing into a bigger business so that the business can give more. Ben and the E5 team are committed to supporting that. Um, they've also got people who have expressed an interest in coming out and teaching pastries and cakes. And I think once we've got solid distribution lines, we can start to bring on other things that hopefully people will love as well. What we've done here is the drop in the ocean. But we're starting to see a ripple effect from it, that people have been inspired to go on and do their own thing. And what we really hope is just continues. More people doing more good, and hopefully more people will benefit. So the bakery has been open now for just over a year, and now all the setup costs have been covered. The team have been able to support 60 people have their sight restored, and 60 young adults go through the training program. But this is only 1 20th of the capacity that the bakery can deliver. So now our next mission is to open a cafe seven miles away in the town where we can access the market. We hope to open that in the next six months. And beyond that, our vision is to be able to support street vendors to sell healthy products for an equivalent price to the unhealthy products they're selling so that they can generate profit selling something that's good for the population. Madeline and I often find ourselves questioning, is any of this actually going to work? And are we crazy? And we usually conclude that we are crazy. But then we remember why we're doing it, the very reasons that brought us to Kenya in the first place to try and do these things. And you remember those two gentlemen who'd been blind for so many years. Well, just a few days after I'd met them, they were in the hospital and they had their surgery. And it went successfully. The gentleman on the left, as his eye patch was removed, slowly looked around the room and started pointed at every one of us to tell us that he could see us. A huge smile formed across his face. And then he leant across to his friend and rubbed his hair and started laughing. And he said, friend, Mze, you've become gray. Little did he know he had also become gray. 
The World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease or infirmity. So surely everybody deserves access to good eye care and to good bread. Thank you.